Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're tuning in from today. And welcome to the webinar. My name is Brett Fye, and I'm the Senior Partner Marketing Manager here at RightScale. Uh, we're very excited to present this webinar today, as it gives us an opportunity to share more about our partnership between Equinix and RightScale, and what that means for you, specifically what it can mean for your hybrid cloud. First, we'd like to kick things off with a poll, and that gives us a sense of who's ending today and uh, helps the speakers to tailor their presentation to you, the audience. So please uh, select the answers that best apply to you. The first question, uh, are you using the cloud today? And here, we mean cloud as infrastructure as a service. So if you're using AWS or SoftLayer, Rackspace, uh, or maybe on your private cloud side, uh, Eucalyptus or CloudStack, um, Please answer whatever applies. Looks like we've got some answers coming in. Okay, so it looks like quite a few are beginning to explore, and uh, and some are already using it. Um, and of course, a, a portion who aren't. I think that the content in this webinar uh, will be especially interesting to those beginning to explore, and uh, there should be something in there uh, for everyone. Okay, the next question. Are you planning to use a hybrid or multi-cloud architecture in 2012? And uh, the options here are yes with uh, two or more public cloud providers, such as Rackspace, AWS. Uh, perhaps it's a public cloud and a managed hosting provider like Datapipe, uh, or a public cloud and your own internal private cloud. And we'll wait for the questions to come in. Okay, this is great. Looks like uh, the majority are looking to deploy a public-private hybrid, uh, which we will have a couple demos to support that. I think you'll find very interesting, and uh, and could also apply to the uh, multi-public cloud architectures as well. And where is your IT infrastructure today? Uh, do you run on-premises, uh, mixed with a cloud, perhaps all in the cloud, or maybe you don't know? Okay, looks like we have some answers coming in. We'll give that just another minute. Okay, so it looks like a mix of on-premises and, and some hosted in the cloud, which of, of course falls in line with the uh, public-private hybrid model, so that's great. And finally, uh, where are your IT users? Uh, do you have a large centralized office, perhaps some remote offices, or some home-based workers, uh, or are you primarily offshore? And just another moment for the answers to come in. Okay, it looks like a, mostly a mix of uh, office space and home-based workers. Uh, well, thank you very much for taking the time uh, to complete these polls. And as I said, it should help our speakers to help tailor their presentations to you. Uh, so. Let's introduce our speakers now. From Equinix, we have Ephraim Barron, uh, the Director of Enterprise Cloud Services. We're thrilled that he could join us today. And on the right scale side, we have Robert Schroll, our Senior Manager of Business Development, and Ryan Geyer, our Sales Engineer, who will be taking you through the live demo later. You may notice that there's a questions window in your GoToWebinar browser. Please use it to ask any questions you have throughout the webinar and Matthew Small, our strategic account executive, will be on hand to answer them. Moving to our agenda, 
Uh, we will start with some brief introductions of our respective companies, and our speakers will take you through our partnership and what it means. And then we'll show you a live demo of a couple core hybrid cloud scenarios that you should find very interesting. And finally, uh, we will have some time at the end of the webinar for a live Q&A session. Again, we encourage you to use the questions window throughout the webinar, and uh, Matthew will answer those. As well, please uh, feel free to ask any questions during the Q&A, and we'll answer them live. So without further ado, I would like to hand off the presentation to Ephraim Barron, the Equinix Director of Enterprise Cloud Services. Thank you very much, Brett. So, yep. So can you hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, so I just wanted to start off, uh, for those of you who may not know, uh, be familiar with Equinix, uh, to give you a brief introduction. So uh, if you don't know us, we're the world's largest provider of carrier-neutral data center services with uh, over 100 facilities in 38 metro areas on five different co continents. Uh, we serve as the major peering points for network providers. And so we have the most network-dense facilities in the world. Uh, we have, uh, I believe, over 90% of Internet traffic passes through our data centers. Uh, we're a 1.8, uh, on target to be a $1.8 billion company uh, this year. And half of that money immediately goes back into building new facilities. So we're very focused on expanding and uh, having a footprint available to our customers. Now, that said, uh, what we provide is co-location, interconnection, support, space power, connectivity in very high-quality data centers. That's all we do. We do not compete with our 4,000 customers uh, who we host in our facilities. Uh, we provide the most solid foundation possible for uh, businesses to run their uh, services and, and uh, network-based applications. So uh, in terms of co-location, again, we have I uh, believe we're up to 104 facilities, um, and these are very high-quality facilities. Uh, in North America, we have um, SSAE 16 certification. Oop, not so fast on the advancing, please. There we go. Um, and in uh, EMEA, the ISO 50,000, 14,000, 1, 27,000, 9,000, certification. So, Again, these are very high uh, quality facilities. Our SLA is five nines. We routinely beat that. Last year we were seven nines of availability. And again, the most network dense facilities, we have about uh, 700 network providers and six million square feet of uh, capacity. We have a never go dark uh, approach, meaning in any metro, uh, we anticipate needs so that we don't run out of capacity, which can be a real challenge if you build your own data center where uh, you find yourself running out of capacity, you need to build in advance of that, and you find yourself either with excess capacity or not enough capacity. So, okay, next slide, please. This shows where we are, the red dots, um, again, 38 metros. It also shows where we're looking, uh, and um, we plan our expansions in close coordination with our customers. There would be no point in us building a facility where nobody wants to be. Uh, so we work closely with our customers to determine where to go to next. Um, sometimes uh, there are uh, challenges getting to, to uh, metros, uh, for instance, uh, India or Moscow, that uh, relate more to uh, local regulations or um, you know, the ability to uh, find the right partner, but uh, by and large, we uh, expand to places where there are uh, major um, ecosystems and, and needs. So, for instance, uh, New York, Hong Kong, those are, are big financial centers, um, you know, Silicon Valley, high tech. So, again, we uh, are always planning our, our next moves because it takes um, 12 to 18 months uh, advanced planning before we start uh, the next facility. Next slide, please. And why this is important is because uh, proximity to users is very uh, critical for a lot of different applications. You have applications uh, at the extreme end, like algorithmic trading, where they talk in terms of microseconds latency. Um, so for them, 
uh, proximity to the networks is, is extremely important. Uh, um, things like streaming media, if you're providing that over more than, say, a 20 millisecond latency link, the user experience is not going to be good at all. Um, you get to web-based apps, and there's many studies showing that users abandon sites that perform badly. So uh, we allow you to distribute close to your users, and uh, so it's not a surprise, for instance, that nine out of the top ten content distribution networks uh, host within our facilities. Uh, so let's see. Next slide, please. And the other thing we offer is a variety of connectivity options. So yes, there is uh, the traditional internet connectivity, layer 3 connectivity, and again, with the number of different network providers, we give you the greatest choice. Um, for example, our Ashburn, D.C. facility is the most network dense facility in the world. You have a choice of uh, close to 200 network providers. And you might say, well, that's fine, but I only need two. Uh, the other thing is we host the uh, network provider's backbone circuits, not, not edge circuits. So you're going to have the highest quality connectivity and the most choice. Um, again, we're the major peering points for the Internet, and so um, you, you have tremendous choice uh, between providers. If you are co-resident in our facility with someone you want to connect to, we offer Direct Connect, and that's a 1 gig or 10 gig fiber link direct from your rack to theirs. Uh, very fast, secure, and cost-effective. And then the third connectivity option is carrier Ethernet. Now, for years, the carriers would exchange traffic with each other. That is uh, now available to service providers, cloud providers. So that gives you a layer two connectivity circuit from your, your cage to millions of buildings worldwide. And uh, that is over a 1 gig or 10 gig uh, fiber link, and it allows you to have uh, quality of service, SLAs, and they're amazingly cost-effective. Uh, you, know, you, you might think that a 1 gig WAN link would be way out of reach. Uh, it really isn't. So the, the different connectivity options can really um, provide flexibility and uh, give you capabilities that you, you might not have been thinking about. So uh, I encourage you to look at the different connectivity options and, and think uh, what you might be able to do with, say, a, a 10 gig fiber link uh, internet connection. Next slide, please. And this has given rise to a number of ecosystems. Um, we'd like to take all the credit for it, but in fact, uh, customers came to us because of the footprint and the network density. So as I mentioned, financial services, uh, we host 600 financial services companies, uh, everything buy side, sell side, market data. Uh, enterprise customers, uh, content, gaming, digital media, uh, obviously some uh, recognizable uh, logos there, and then cloud services. Uh, so we have uh, 300 cloud services and another 500 uh, IT service providers that we host within Equinix, and all of that is built around the network um, because people want this network-dense, uh, rich ecosystem and the ability to connect uh, both within the ecosystem and then to your customers, uh, we believe, adds real value to, to uh, the platform. We, and we call this uh, the combination of facilities and network platform equinix. It's a global platform on which to build. Next slide, please. So again, between the traffic exchanges, the uh, combination of network providers, the ecosystems, and then what we have uh, also is Equinix Marketplace. And this is an ability of our customers to see who else is hosted within our facility so that they can connect with each other. As I said, you can direct connect uh, with the fiber link to other customers within our facilities and uh, have a very performant, cost-effective, secure way to uh, use and sell services to others. So this provides simplicity, functionality, reduced complexity, uh, and the ability to deliver high quality uh, and end user experience. Next slide, please. So summing up, uh, Platform Equinix is a global network dense platform that enables high performance clouds. Uh, 
five nines uptime is our SLA. Uh, we put you in very close proximity to your user base, and the statistic here that I want to make sure you uh, see is sub-10 millisecond latency to 90% of the population of North America, Europe, and uh, a number of large uh, Asian metros. So with that, uh, you can build your cloud and be sure that uh, it will perform and deliver a high-quality user experience. Next slide. And so this is what makes uh, our partnership with Brightscale such a, a natural fit. Uh, our platform of ecosystems, networks, and customers combined with Brightscale's multi-cloud platform provides tremendous value to our customers. So with that, I'll hand it off to Robert Troll. And take it away, Robert. Thanks, Ephraim. Appreciate it. Um, I think an important point from this slide as we transition into a couple of slides of background from a right scale perspective is, as you said here very clearly, is uh, bridging the app and infrastructure piece so that you can focus directly on your customers and your business. And we'll talk a little bit about, of course, our experience as right scale uh, actually doing that. So I'll go ahead and advance the slides. So from a background from a right scale perspective, there's some pretty key interesting facts here, but I think the most important one that we're all very proud of is that we have pioneered cloud management. Uh, we've been around and we've been doing this for a long time. We have some very deep technical uh, and business and sales resources to bring to bear to help solve this problem, but the platform enables and helps uh, provide a variety of different solutions and things, and we'll take a look at that in just a moment and talk about it. Another interesting fact, uh, 3.9 million servers have already been launched using RightScale around the globe. Uh, we are the largest, uh, we are powering some of the largest production cloud deployments, and we do have over seven fully supported uh, cloud providers, and that number is continuing to grow. Lots of key facts and things here, but I think it's important by the fact that this is not just a piece of software. It is software delivered in a SaaS model with skills and people and things behind it, and partnerships like we're discussing here today with Platform Equinix that are going to bring you the real value and help solve your true business problems. And let's give some examples of some actual customers that are doing this today, uh, whether it be uh, Zynga, okay, which is probably one of the best examples from a hybrid cloud perspective uh, that is, of course, uh, running uh, with RightScale uh, in both public and private, and then you've got some other great names that are mentioned here in a variety of different industries and things, whether it be uh, in tele, uh, television, communications, uh, whether it be in the gaming space, uh, healthcare, uh, or other uh, business spaces like the IH, IHG uh, Hotel Group. So pretty impressive list. Uh, there's more details and things that can also be found, of course, on each of our websites as it talks about some of the customers and case studies, so we won't go into that uh, detail here. Some reasons for right scale, uh, and five of them are shown, and there's certainly a lot of a lot more of them, but I think we'll kind of go through each of them uh, with an overview. Uh, first one is, of course, abstraction with customization. Uh, the ability to complete and manage your customization, but not to, have, not have to have it be so particular and specific that you can't reuse it, okay? Uh, a lot of times in the systems and things or the methods that you may have employed previously, You've customized, you've configured, you've written scripts and things, uh, but now how do I make that reusable? And how do I make that easy to deploy again? Uh, that's the great thing about the whole management platform and the way that the uh, right scale uh, management platform actually works is it allows you to abstract that customization later. The ability to choose your own clouds, vendor freedom, of course, is very important, and we're stressing that here today in your hybrid uh, cloud presentation where, of course, you can now be able to uh, bring a variety of different providers and things together. Equinix, of course, I think, sits squarely in the middle, giving you that choice, giving you that direct connectivity that Ephraim mentioned, and then getting to the platform for a visibility and control. Now that you've employed and deployed a hybrid cloud, you have the visibility and control to manage it all in one place. Now, we'll get into some details on the following slide on exactly what I mean about that. Automation in the process to make it scalable and make your applications and your infrastructure super agile, that's the goal and the benefit, of course, behind what RightScale does. And then, of course, you know, while you have features and functionality within the platform, you have to have strong cloud expertise. And both of our companies bring that to you, both from a management platform perspective, as well as a total platform and, uh, you know, global connectivity. So a brief slide on the RightScale platform itself, of course, RightScale is the cloud management platform. It sits squarely between your applications and your infrastructure. 
Uh, I'll cover each of the points here briefly. Uh, we'll talk about governance first, the ability, of course, to control access and security, track usage reports, real-time run rate projections so that you can control and understand your spend that you're going to have on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. Uh, the marketplace, we have a marketplace called the multi-cloud marketplace. Now, the great thing about this is it gives you the ability to access cloud-ready, customizable server templates. And I won't get into detail exactly what that means. Ryan, during the course of the presentation, will give you a little bit of context about that. But you'll find some tremendous power that when you implement the platform, and you can do it today in a private only, a public only, or a hybrid model, and then you can continue to look through the marketplace and find additional solutions that we can bring to bear as part of your right scale implementation, whether it be load balancer solutions, database sharding, or other things like that. Automation, of course, is key. The ability to monitor, alert, trigger, manage auto scaling, database backup, disaster recovery, and automate any repetitive type operations that, of course, are absolutely critical, back kind of relating to a governance perspective, but the fact that you don't want to have to have a human actually executing that task from start to finish, the automation is key. And then the configuration framework, the ability, of course, to execute your scripts and provision your servers with complete consistency. And that's really important because in today's DevOps world and so on, as you're sitting down and writing scripts, you think you've accounted for everything that needs to happen. I've forgotten two or three key steps. Oh, that's not going to work. I need a management platform that says that I have absolutely done these steps. I have absolutely, uh, you know, defined what my process is, and I can go back and look from a governance reporting and a logging perspective what happened after I actually installed and deployed those servers. Okay? And I, I, we're going to tie back to the same slide that Ephraim had just a few moments ago. The great thing about this, of course, is that, and I'll do the build right there, Let's just show you the fact that, you know, from a global coverage perspective, both from a public and managed cloud perspective and the public cloud partners that we're already working with, that we're already uh, helping customers manage right scale with, Equinix now with the uh, global reach and things that they have. And then you'll notice in some of the facilities, and I'll just use Seattle as an example or other places where you see the dots rather close together. Um, I won't speak directly as to whether or not that particular provider is in that location, but as uh, Ephraim, I think, mentioned, is that, you know, from a co-location facility perspective and from an accessibility to the other public cloud providers, they've got the reach, the direct connectivity, and things that you're looking for so that whether you are in a private, a public, or as we're excited to share with you today, uh, the hybrid model, uh, we're going to be able to help you out both from a resource pool perspective as well as a management so that this doesn't get out of hand, it's cost controlled, uh, you've managed your risk and things, and we'll talk about that during the course of the demonstration and, uh, and uh, have everything uh, go off well. So, if why don't you and I kind of talk about both of these, uh, uh, all of these bullet points um, together. And I think the first one between you and I uh, really kind of ties together directly um, uh, both of our offerings. Yeah, yeah, I agree that uh, uh, having cloud without management uh, puts all the onus on the user and uh, you guys make it easy and that's that's great and then of course from a, a, the second bullet point is, is listed there of course your ability to choose your public and your private cloud providers and be able to manage that and deploy all under one umbrella so that ties in once again to the right scale uh, management cloud management platform and then uh, yeah, and with, yeah go ahead. Uh, Sorry, with your private cloud, uh, whether you host that on your own prem or in a colo facility, uh, we have lots of customers who, for instance, will tether into our facility, just put some network gear, and then back all to their own physical premises. Uh, but again, then having the management platform to, to have consistent management uh, across both those environments uh, is, is tremendously valuable to the users. Right. And the control and security in, in one view. Um, so whether, like you said, the, uh, the direct connect or the fact that you've already got the facility already wired and now you're just doing a direct connect between the two, the control and the security is absolutely key. You're not looking to create additional risk for your organization. You want to have the ability to understand and see everything that's happening. And the only way to do that is with RightScale. It lets you focus on your application, your data, and your customers and not worry about the infrastructure. Talking with both of us and bringing a solution like this together in a hybrid cloud will help you get back to getting your business work done of the day. All right. 
So we're really excited from uh, uh, being able to announce and talk about the partnership, but of course the proof is definitely in a demonstration. I'm next going to introduce Ryan Geyer. He's one of our senior solutions engineers, and uh, he's going to walk us through a demonstration. Ryan? Thank you, Robert. <clears throat> so I'm going to just switch over screens here real quick, bring uh, our right scale dashboard into the view here. So I'm already logged in to spare you the, the rigmarole watching me type in my username and password. But what you're seeing here um, is the Red Scale dashboard when you first log in. Um, and what we have here is a, a unique customizable view for each user. Uh, what you can see is we have these sort of Web 2.0 widgets that you can drag around, resize. These are actually based on uh, liquid markup, so you can write and customize your own to expose the portions of the RightScale environment and the infrastructure that you're viewing uh, that's appropriate for you. Um, what you might notice right at the, the top here is I've actually taken the liberty of, of putting in an architecture diagram that we've used in the past to show kind of what a hybrid model and a bursting diagram, what a bursting infrastructure might look like. Um, and this, I, I'll note that it is rather old, and what I'm going to show you doesn't exactly meet this model, and it actually helps to highlight why uh, we're really excited about the uh, Equinix partnership um, and the networking that they really bring to, uh, to that partnership and to your abilities to deploy infrastructure. If you look at this diagram, it shows uh, one deployment that's specific in your private cloud, which has a front-end load balancer, application server, and database server, the typical three-tier environment, and then a more or less isolated environment that's also running in Amazon US East, which has a front-end load balancer and some PHP app servers. It's a really kind of siloed uh, use case here, where you'd be able to burst out some of those services to uh, Amazon from your private cloud. What we'll show you as we go along uh, is that with the ability to host your private cloud in an Equinix facility uh, and then have a direct connect to Amazon or DataPipe or any of the other public cloud providers which are also hosted in Equinix, uh, you really change this model. You have the ability to really have your application literally distributed and bursted across those. And we'll talk about that a bit more. I wanted to also highlight uh, in the dashboard, I've got a minimized column over here on the left. Uh, that again, this is customizable for each user. Uh, up at the top, we have some bookmarks. This will actually take us to the deployment that we'll be talking about today. Um, some quick monitoring tools that shows us the number of Apache requests and CPU use that's coming into the load balancers for our deployments. Uh, but this can be customized, of course, and show you anything in your environment. Uh, and then a rolling uh, list of events that are happening in the account and in the environment as well. Uh, this is also exposed via an RSS feed, so you can consume it that way. Uh, for the time being, I'm going to go ahead and click on the actual uh, deployment that we're going to be showing. And this, this is one of the key, um, key concepts within RightScale, the concept of a deployment. Uh, for those of you that are used to deploying in a, in a bare metal real world data center, uh, this is not an uncommon concept. The deployment is many servers that are uh, set up and configured to work together uh, for a particular application. So in this case, it's a three-tiered web application. Um, we have the app server listed up here at the top, and it's a Tomcat Java-based uh, application server. Uh, we have a master and slave database. Those are both MySQL-based, and then front-end load balancers as well. Now what you'll notice is that all of these uh, are running on a cloud stack based uh, cloud. We've actually borrowed our engineering resources to be able to set up this demo. Uh, what this is representative of is a cloud stack based private cloud that's hosted in an Equinix facility uh, where we're able to run these particular uh, servers and applications. So you might think of a, a situation where uh, in a larger environment, in a larger corporate environment, um, this particular group uh, was given some access to a private cloud that's hosted in the Equinix facility, and they may have a limited amount of resources they, they can, can consume. Uh, we've got five servers running here, and that may be all that they're allotted. So if you're running kind of your base amount of traffic in this environment, uh, but you get a peak in traffic, what can you do? 
Well, since the private cloud is hosted in an Equinix facility and we have, in this case, a direct connect to Amazon, we have the ability to burst out additional Tomcat application servers into Amazon. That's actually what's shown down here in the arrays, uh, which is this AWS bursting array. And I'll touch on this briefly, and we'll, we'll come back to this actually to talk about some of the details. But this is based on that same application server. So the exact same server type that you're launching in your private cloud to host that Java Tomcat application is being used here in Amazon. So that's your configuration management time back to those four points. So the fact that you've already configured it, you've got all of the configuration parameters and everything set, it's very easy to deploy another server as needed based on the alerts and notifications of the system. Exactly right, Robert. So the reality here is that we're putting all of the pieces together into this server template, which I'll, I'll show a little bit more of the detail in, so that you really end up with the exact same configuration, regardless of whether you're uh, deploying this in an Amazon region or your private cloud or another public cloud. It's all exactly the same. Really, it really takes it up a level. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, great. So what we'll do, we'll actually go ahead and jump right into that server template and I'll show you uh, what that looks like. So of course there's the base description of it and we'll, we'll skip over that for now. We know that this is a Tomcat application server and we'll focus on the images tab. Um, this is really one of the core pieces of what makes RedScale able to deploy the same types of servers, the same type of workloads across any of the clouds which we support. So what you see listed here is a list of the operating system images, uh, the different variants of them, uh, and even potentially the, the different targets. So this top one is a CentOS version 5.6, it's 64-bit. Um, and it's supported in the majority of the public clouds that we support, which is the Amazon regions as well as Rackspace. And then these next three servers are all, uh, these next three images rather, are all also uh, CentOS 5.6, 64-bit, uh, but they're targeted to specific hypervisors. So KVM hypervisor, VMware hypervisor, and Zen server hypervisor. And you can see that these support different public clouds including our private cloud, which happens to be running Zen Server here, uh, is supported by this Zen Server image. So really what we're doing here is each one of these binaries are actually unique. Each one in each of the Amazon regions is a specific binary that's in that region. Um, the ones for the uh, different hypervisors are actually binary, binary images which we make available to you to upload to your cloud or which are already available in the public clouds that we support. So when you go to provision a server through RightScale, when you pick the cloud that you're going to launch it on, we automatically and intelligently find the correct image, make the correct API call to that cloud provider, and use the base underlying image. What this really does for us is it gives us that base operating system with you know, current security patches and just that base, plus an agent that we install, which is called RightLink, which really helps us to do all the automation. We'll touch on that a, a little bit further here as well. That feeds all the data back to the management platform then. So once that's actually installed, that's the, actually how it's happening. Precisely. So that's really the gateway between that running virtual machine and the right scale backend system. It's how we do the configuration management. It's how we're able to send data back and forth between that image. And Gives some great power that you haven't been able to have before, that's for sure. Absolutely. Okay. So. Once we've launched uh, and provisioned that base operating system, uh, we're going to talk right up into about that uh, configuration management piece of it. So we've launched a base operating system. Obviously, it's not anything more than just CentOS or Ubuntu or Red Hat. Um, the next step then is that agent, which we just talked about, is going to make a request back to RightScale and uh, identify it as the virtual machine that you just launched through the RightScale system. Um, and the right scale system will start sending down these scripts, which is going to configure the system. Uh, so in this case, this is a Tomcat uh, Java application server. Um, so, you know, the beginning is some basic kind of uh, homework and house cleaning type things. We set up a, some firewall rules. We set up NTP. We download some tools that we're going to use throughout the configuration. Uh, and then towards the end is where we start getting into the things that are a little bit more specific to this application server. So let me ask a question there. I think 
there, this, this list could look long to someone and could look overwhelming, but the great thing about what RightScale does is that there's already best demonstrated practices in each of these pieces, and then it's about being able to tweak and configure based on your business needs rather than having to start from scratch. Precisely. Uh, so, in fact, the server template that we're showing you is one of the ones that uh, is available in our multi-cloud marketplace, which uh, Robert pointed uh, out during his uh, slide presentation. Um, this is exactly the way that it's deployed and delivered. So those six years of experience that we have in building these uh, sorts of deployments, building application servers and deploying them on public clouds is all baked into this. All the best practices and all that is in here. I tie back to that 3.9 million. That's it. Yeah. Okay, great. So in this case, uh, again, since we're launching a, a Tomcat application server, we're doing things that are, of course, appropriate for that. We're going to install Apache. We're going to install Tomcat. Uh, we're going to actually grab the latest version of your uh, application code. So this could be a, a number of different mechanisms used to grab this. It could pull it from version control, uh, subversion, git. Uh, it could also pull a WAR file from a URL that you supply. Um, so it gets the system configured. It actually takes and downloads and deploys the current version of your Java application. Uh, and then Further, uh, towards the end here, we actually take this server and once it's up and running and it's able to accept requests as a, your application, uh, we actually take and attach this server to a load balancer. So if you recall in the deployment that uh, I showed you earlier, there were two load balancers that were running in that deployment and they're tagged um, with a particular load balance listening pool. So what this script does is it actually makes a query for all the servers that are in the same deployment as this new application server that's coming up and becoming aware and becoming part of the deployment. It identifies those load balancers and it's able to make a request through the right scale system to have those load balancers add this new application server with the dynamic IP address that it's been assigned. Think about all the time you have to do that manually before and the chance of error and the lack of repeatability that may certainly happen. Precisely. And this is one of the key tenets, too, of the way that we're able to auto scale. If we weren't able to automatically set all these things up, get these application servers automatically registered with load balancers, there'd still be manual steps. We could provision servers, but someone, a sysadmin, would have to go in and make some changes to load balancers, database servers, and so forth. We've really automated that whole process by using server templates and allowing you to execute this configuration management code as the server's coming up. So we talked a lot about the, the boot scripts here, which really gets that server configured uh, initially. We have two other types of scripts that are associated with the server template, and we'll touch on those real briefly here. Operational scripts are scripts that are used as administrative tasks throughout the lifespan of that server. So again, we're talking about a Java Tomcat application server here. So some of the administrative tasks that you might need to do is perhaps grab the latest version of your application code. This is actually a duplicated script from the boot phase, which happens when the server first comes up. But you may want to do that during the lifespan of the server as well, where you actually change the version of the application which you're going to install and rerun this script, which is going to pull it in. Uh, in doing that, you may want to first detach this server from your load balancer when you're doing that update. And then when you're done, you may want to reattach it to your load balancer. Those are all predefined operational tasks that you can do, uh, and they're associated with the server template. Helps document really not only what the server is and how it gets to that state, uh, but also what things you can do with it uh, over time. And better for troubleshooting also. Precisely. Okay, great. Uh, and then this last section here is decommission scripts. So we've been talking a lot about the you know, ephemeral and elastic nature of, of cloud computing. When you boot the server, of course, we have all the automation in place to get it operational. Uh, but then in this ephemeral environment, when we're also terminating servers, we're going to need to do some cleanup. So again, with this application server, one of the logical things we're going to want to do is remove this server from a load balance pool so that that load balancer is no longer having to do health checks to a server that's no longer there. It's no longer trying to route traffic to it and so forth. I'll tell you how many times I've run across that problem before. <laughs> okay, great. Very common. Yes. Yeah. So what I want to do is uh, take you back to that deployment real quick, and we'll take a, a closer look at a couple things here. We've talked a bit about that configuration management piece and shows really how we're able to automate those things. 
Uh, and we've shown you that blueprint, that skeleton of a server, right? We showed you that Tomcat application server. What I want to do is click into the actual running server. Uh, so we're back at the deployment. I'm going to click on that application server, which is running in our private cloud in this case. Uh, and there's some operational information, the server template that's being used, where it's running, and so on. What I want to show you here, though, is our monitoring. So we're using CollectD to do all this monitoring. Uh, and anything, basically, that you want to monitor on that system, there's either likely an existing plugin for CollectD, or since CollectD is an open source project, very well documented, uh, there's the opportunity for you to write your own plugin or even use a generic plugin for tailing a log file or so forth. And sure, information. and with some of the other partners that we have in the marketplace, we've even implemented some of the monitoring specific to their application, so it's uh, still giving you that single pane of glass view back to everything that's going on. Precisely. Okay. And so beyond just, of course, giving you these great uh, graphs in the dashboard, which look lovely, uh, and give you a great overall health check of your uh, operating systems, we also use this for some additional automation tasks. So if I take you over to the alerts tab of this running server, this is really where that comes into play. Any one of the pieces of information that we're collecting and pulling back to the right scale system, we can create an alert, which is basically a check on any one of those particular monitoring metrics. If they reach a certain threshold, then we can take a certain action. Um, on the alerts tab here, all of the alerts that you say that you see, save for the top two here, uh, are actually ones that are built into that server template. So again, that server template, that uh, blueprint of this server contains everything you need to know about it, including what are common error conditions for this particular type of server. And additional conditions can be added based on the type of application that you're delivering. So you're not, you're not uh, landlocked in any way. Precisely. And in fact, you can customize these in real time, change the server template. So now this running over your hybrid cloud, the power is just amazing as to what can happen. Exactly. Okay. So the actions that you can take from any one of these alert conditions are that, uh, of course, you can send an email on a particular cadence. Uh, you can run a script either on the server that has the condition or, again, on any one of the servers in the same deployment. So, again, sort of that concept of this server being aware of its environment, using that deployment to do automation tasks. Uh, the other actions that you can perform is that you can restart this instance. Uh, you know, maybe it's a memory use issue and you know that a restart will take care of it, so you can script out that remedial action. You can also relaunch this. Again, since we're using server templates and we're defining that definition of exactly what the server is going to be when it's launched, we can terminate the running virtual machine that's behind it and launch a brand new one that's going to come up in exactly the same configuration. And then the last two things that you can do are actually what these top alerts are here for, which is that you can automatically add or remove servers from this deployment using that array that we talked about near the beginning. So these top two alerts are doing precisely that. For demonstration purposes, we're using a simple monitoring value, which is the CPU idle. So if the CPU idle is uh, greater than 80% for two minutes, that's an indication that there's not a lot of use on this particular application server. We can start removing servers from this deployment that are sharing the load with this application server. Can I have you step back a second? I'd actually like to see a script example. Could sure. you just show what that looks like and just the level of detail of what's there? Sure, so for one of the scripts on a server template? Sure, that'd be fine. Yep. So let's go ahead and take a look at it. Um, the server templates that I was showing you were all Chef-based server templates. Okay. Um, and so the Chef code is actually visible uh, in Git. Uh, so I can actually show you what one of those looks like. Com, print, scale, um, cookbooks, public. Um, so this is actually where all of the code for our uh, base server templates that we provide are actually sourced from. Of course, we cache that in the right scale backend system and we uh, allow you to associate those with server templates. Okay. The reason I'm showing you the code here is that for Chef scripts, uh, we don't yet have the ability to show that in the dashboard. Okay. For write scripts, we can. Okay. Uh, that's a feature that's coming very soon. Uh, but since we're talking about the new server templates, I want to show you the actual code that's executing. 
Uh, so we'll give you perhaps the example of something fairly simple, sysNTP, where we're setting up uh, NTP servers. Okay. Uh, we'll look at the recipe that was associated with that server template, if you recall. There yep. was one named sys underscore NTP yep. colon colon default. Mm -hmm. And this is essentially what that code looks like. So we do a quick marker at the beginning that marks the start of this in the audit entry. Uh, we check for which type of operating system we're using and install the correct package for that, uh, so on and so forth. So this is what that code looks like in Chef. Right. Um, real quickly, we do have some of our older server templates in here as well that are write script based, and I can show you what a write script looks like in the write scale dashboard. Okay. Uh, this is a very, very simple base server template, does a lot of the same things, sets our time zone, starts uh, setting up monitoring so far. We'll take a quick look at the monitoring script to show you what that looks like. Uh, so again, these are uh, created and maintained in the right scale system as well. This is a simple bash script right. uh, that's installing CollectD and configuring it to talk to our backend server. But again, you can see from the openness of the platform, we want to bring things together and make it easy for you to manage, but we also want to make it so that you can see exactly what's happening and be able to tweak it as needed and if needed for your organization. Precisely. Okay, great. So we'll take you back real quickly to that running application server and we'll kind of finish that story about uh, how we do auto scaling because I think it's it's key really to uh, the environment that we have set up here. Uh, so the converse of, of scaling down is scaling up here. If our CPU idle value is less than 60% for two minutes, well then there's a whole lot of use on this server. Uh, and likely the other servers that are involved in this deployment as well. Uh, so what this is going to do is vote to grow that array that we talked about before. So what I'll do is I'll take you right back up to the deployment again. Um, and as we discussed at the beginning, these servers at the top are sort of the steady state servers that are always running, always up and, and going for your deployment. And then we're able to burst out into Amazon using this array. And those alert conditions that we were talking about are working at, against and voting against this particular array. So okay. we did show you the array earlier. I'm going to show you some of the, the key kind of knobs and dials that you can turn uh, with regard to auto scaling here. You can determine a minimum and maximum number of servers that you're going to run here. So our minimum is currently zero. When there's no peak and load, we don't need to be running an Amazon and running up a bill. Uh, we've also set a maximum of five. Perhaps we know that our application can't scale uh, beyond five additional nodes. Uh, maybe there's a budgetary reason for that, but we can set the maximum number that we can launch. Now, we use sort of some key verbiage in that these servers are actually voting to either increase or decrease the number of servers here. That's important because you don't want a situation where you have a single server that's you know, sending out that distress signal that it's under load uh, and having it unilaterally adding or removing things from the deployment. You want a consensus across all the servers that are sharing that load. Right. And that could be both uh, automated or manual, and you can make that choice once again as well. So instead of it just happening, depending on how your infrastructure is deployed, you may actually want to have a person actually vote and say, the servers have voted, I'm voting, and now it's time to actually burst up or burst down. Precisely. Yeah. Yeah. So the, the alternative would be instead of actually using the voting mechanism against this array, you would have alerts sent to a system administrator. They would start getting the pages, the emails, and right. so forth. They would go into the system, evaluate the, the current state, and then make the choice to launch servers into this array. Okay. Great. Uh, so that's really the, the key of that uh, bursting capability. So really the moral of the story here is, uh, you know, in a hybrid environment like this using Equinix, you can set up your base system on a private cloud, take advantage of all of the automation and configuration capabilities of RightScale, uh, but do it managed in an Equinix facility that's right on all of the great uh, networks that they provide and which can be direct connected to the public environments which we've shown here with the case of Amazon. So the idea is to build to your base requirement, build to your base load, uh, and then be able to take advantage of that elasticity of the public cloud uh, to handle those bursts in traffic. Okay. So that's, that's really kind of the majority of what I wanted to show you in the, uh, in the dashboard and in the demo. We can maybe touch on very quickly the uh, multi-cloud marketplace, which we've talked about thus far. Got about one minute. You can do that, and then we'll get to the Q&A piece. Absolutely. <laughs> Sounds great. So we'll show you this real quickly. 
Uh, what's in here, I showed you a three-tier architecture with um, uh, Java Tomcat. Uh, we also have three-tier environments that uh, include PHP um, or uh, Ruby on Rails. Um, we also have a majority, uh, sorry, a number of different types of server templates in here that you can select from. Those are the ones that we maintain. There's also community offered ones and ISV templates that are offered by uh, lots of different partners of ours. So usually if you're looking for something, you can go in here and search for it and, and find some assets that you can use. So there's a lot of power in the marketplace where it's not just items and things that are created by Rightscale, but we actually have community contributors and partners that can drive particular solutions and offerings. So once again, I mentioned load balancing and I mentioned database control and things like that. There's a whole variety of things that you can discover in the marketplace. And it's not all things that you necessarily have to do when you first get started, but they bring some tremendous value and should be considered. And that's, once again, I'll play back to that cloud expertise slide that we talked about a while ago that says, you know, we really we want to get a discussion going with one or both of us as soon as you can to understand both from an infrastructure and a cloud management perspective exactly what needs to happen, what are the orders of things done, the years of experience, the number of servers we deployed, Equinix's facility, global reach, and their skills and things. Uh, it's, it's an ideal partnership. Absolutely. Okay, great. All right, so why don't we uh, move into uh, the uh, Q&A phase uh, next uh, to help close us out before we get to the, uh, the top of the hour. Uh, we've got a couple of questions and, uh, and things that have come in. That have come in. Um, and maybe I'll take one since I'm speaking first and just kind of mention it. And uh, Ryan, maybe um, you want to talk maybe just a little bit about how RightScale, we've got a question that's come in. How does RightScale integrate with CloudStack and OpenStack? Sure. Which is, a, I think, a big thing these days. Absolutely. So uh, what we were showing you with the server template there uh, were particular write images, we call them, for particular hypervisors. Um, so the underlying piece of those uh, those write images would be reused regardless of whether you're using CloudStack or OpenStack. Uh, the private cloud that we set up that we showed you in the demo uh, was a CloudStack-based private cloud. Uh, we also have support for OpenStack. Um, it's currently uh, in, a, in a private form at this point. If you wanted to get some access to that, you can contact us and we can, we can talk you through some of the requirements of setting that up properly and getting it integrated with Rightscale. Uh, but expect to see some really good things on that in the near future. Uh, we also integrate uh, very tightly with Eucalyptus as well. Uh, so if you want that uh, Amazon compatible API, uh, we can let you use a, an environment that uh, uses Eucalyptus as well. All right, good answer. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, next one that's come in, uh, Ephraim, I think this one's going to be for you. What are the relative costs of the different connectivity options? Sure. Um, so uh, using as a baseline uh, optimized Internet, um, and, of course, for that, because of the density of providers, the number of choices you have, you're going to get the best rates for that. Um, if you look at carrier Ethernet, you're eliminating local loop which typically runs between anywhere from 20 to 45 percent of your total network cost. So right away you can, you can reduce the cost. And uh, then if you go with Direct Connect, um, you're looking at a third to a fifth of the cost by, by using Direct Connect. So uh, you can really reduce your network costs by going with Direct Connect. So, um, in terms of scale, if, if optimized Ethernet is a one, um, carrier Ethernet is about uh, 0.55, and uh, direct connect is about 0.2. Okay, great. A very valuable question and a, and a very good answer. Thanks, Ephraim. Um, another question has come in, uh, and I'll just read it uh, exactly as it was written. So if I want to create a custom server template, can I choose from multiple scripting languages like Bash, Chef, or Python? Ryan? Yep, great. So um, the, the short answer is yes, you absolutely can. So admittedly, the, the demonstration uh, and so sort of what we talked about was a little bit heavy on the Chef side. Uh, it's a decision that we've made going forward to make our lives easier to develop the server templates. But the right script that I showed you uh, uh, when we went through some of that uh, that one was based on Bash. You can also use Perl, Python, Ruby, whatever you like. So you can even end up with a server template that uses a combination of those configuration management technologies. 
if you choose to write a write script in bash it doesn't mean that every other write script on your server template has to be bash it can be a mix of bash and Perl and ruby uh, you can also mix in some chef scripts there so whatever you're comfortable with on the configuration management side you can absolutely use so in some of those scripts that you've shown uh, some of those uh, how you break down some of the work or the script that might need to be done may not all be done by one person is that correct and so, therefore, it's not about having to retrain your entire organization on a particular scripting language. If you need to use Bash, if you want to use Chef, Perl, you can use them intermixed in the course of the platform and in the course of the scripting and server templates. Absolutely. You That's know, so, awesome. Yeah, you may end up with your, your DevOps folks building sort of that base configuration that it launches with, uh, but then sys administrators may need to go in and do, you know, routine maintenance and doing things of that nature. They may write the operational scripts in a completely different language and technology. Okay. Um, let's talk about the uh, layers required for a private cloud. Um, next questions come in. Uh, what about Hyper-V, VMware, specifically vSphere, vCloud, private cloud support? Yep. So we do support the VMware technologies. Um, essentially the level of support and the, the layer in the sort of cloud stack that we, uh, that we support is the ESXi hypervisor. Uh, on top of that, currently the way we would integrate with that would be through uh, Citrus Cloud Stack technology to be able to uh, aggregate that API for us. Uh, we're looking all the time at new technologies and new places for us to innovate in the market. So, uh, you know, look for changes in that space as well. Okay. All right. Uh, one more. we got about uh, three minutes left, so we want to be respectful of everybody's time. We'll ask uh, one more question. Um, can you explain a little bit more about the right link agent? Uh, and uh, the ability for the VM to speak with the platform, uh, and what about ports and security and things? Just because, of course, that's the first thing that gets into this process. That's how it gets started. That's what enables everything else. Of course, we've spent a lot of time and have some pretty strong security background on that, but let's make sure folks clearly understand that piece as well. Sure, absolutely. So the RightLink agent, uh, all of its communications are outbound, uh, and they're all outbound over port 443. It's all basically SSL-based requests coming back to our system. Um, so from a security perspective, that's all signed, secured, encrypted, all that great stuff. Um, and, you know, really it's very lightweight. We do as much as we can to limit the amount of communication that it does and the amount that really impacts your system. It's there to facilitate that communication with our back end, you know, accept a new request to run an operational script or a boot script. Uh, and then execute that and then get out of the way. That's really its entire purpose. Uh, even the collect-D and uh, remote syslog, which I failed to mention in detail that we do send back, uh, that's entirely optional. That's actually configured by scripts on the server template, uh, and those are sent back to different back-end systems on the right scale side. So if you didn't want those features, if you wanted to remove monitoring or logging, you wanted to redirect that to your own systems, it's as simple as removing those scripts. So the very bare minimum we need is that outbound connection on port 443, and there's very, very little, very little traffic over that. Oh, that's great. Okay. Um, uh, I think we'll close the Q&A session. Uh, and uh, I want to mention, of course, uh, take a look at uh, the information that's shown on your screen. I want to thank the folks, of course, uh, from Equinix uh, as we're here together announcing our partnership. Uh, some very key important information is listed on your screen. Please take advantage of taking a look at, of course, the, the right scale free edition. The web link is uh, shown here on the webinar and on your screen, and you can go access that afterwards. Uh, there's two important uh, contact points, uh, both from a telephone and an email perspective. Uh, both for Wrightscale right and Equinix, uh, and then, of course, from uh, some more background uh, as it relates to some uh, additional webinar archives that can be accessed, and you can hear some of us on some of those uh, great recordings, and you can take advantage of that uh, free from our site as well. I want to mention, of course, the Wrightscale right User Conference coming up in the June time frame in New York. We'd love to see and meet and greet you there and have some deeper discussions uh, and uh, have some other opportunities to, to meet with you in person. I uh, want to thank, of course, Ephraim and the team from Equinix that were here with us uh, as partners uh, today during the course of the presentation and the demonstration. I think we very clearly got across the uh, benefits of bursting and the, the, the uh, operations and the work, of course, necessary is how you would actually manage a hybrid cloud, uh, both from an infrastructure and a cloud management platform perspective. Uh, Ephraim, did you want to uh, add any last-minute comments before we uh, call a close to the webinar? Um, just that uh, there's additional information out on our website that 
www.equinix.com. Uh, there's some white papers, including a comparison of optimized internet versus uh, just uh, standard internet. And um, just uh, look forward to any uh, follow-up conversations people might want to have. Right. It's definitely about the. You know, it's really about taking the next step, which is actually reaching out to one or both of us in whatever order you find necessary. Uh, but certainly, your cloud management platform on top of a powerful hybrid cloud solution. What we can do with Equinix is why we're talking about it, bringing together valuable partners like this so that you can understand uh, the true business value. Again, we appreciate everyone's time today. Uh, check out our other webinars and archives, and we'll uh, close out the webinar for there. Have a great rest of your day wherever you are, and we look forward to speaking with you in person soon. Thank you. Thanks.